The stolen objects combine into a massive weapon. Very good. Out of control, but Batman's ready. Freeze, Batman. Take this, hot shot. Batman and Robin are here to break the ice. We're going to finish this. When you're a kid, you do a lot of learning through observation. We look to our role models, whether they be real or fictional, for guidance on how to live our life the right way and what values we should uphold. But while we all have our own favorite heroes, we also have our own favorite villains to match. And naturally, there is plenty to learn from them as well. But why do we love a good bad guy in the first place? Why do we sometimes gravitate towards the characters we're supposed to hate? Well, besides the fact that there is a bit of illicit satisfaction to enjoying something you're explicitly told you're not supposed to like, it's also not uncommon to see villains simply be more well-written characters than their heroic counterparts. Their backstories can be just as deep and sometimes even tragic. They can be cool, charismatic, or just absurdly powerful, and they serve an important function of giving our hero someone to bounce off of. In a lot of ways, you simply can't have a good hero if you don't also have a good villain. And throughout the years, few heroes have been more defined by their rogues gallery than Batman. As a child of the 90s, Batman the Animated Series was my first real exposure to the city of Gotham, and Batman quickly became one of my favorite superheroes. But of course, I had to have a favorite villain too, and while he may not be the most famous antagonist the series ever had, the one that always stood out to me the most was Mr. Freeze. Although Mark Hamill's Joker would probably win any poll for Batman's most popular nemesis, Mr. Freeze's debut episode, Heart of Ice, is commonly cited by fans and critics alike as one of, if not the best single episode of Batman the Animated Series, period. And it's easy to see why. Premiering early on in the show's first season, the episode retconned Freeze's backstory and took someone who had previously been a throwaway character and gave him some actual pathos as well as elevating the storytelling in the show to a level far above your average Saturday morning cartoon. But to figure out how Freeze's character became so instantly impactful, we first need to take a look at where his character was up until this point. Back when he was originally created, Mr. Freeze didn't even have his permanent name yet. Debuting as Mr. Zero in Batman issue number 121, he wasn't actually given the moniker of Mr. Freeze until he showed up in the 1960s Adam West TV show. But in both instances, he was still largely considered a low-tier gimmick character. He was mostly just another villain of the week, out to steal diamonds. Well, now is a famous star of Kashmir Diamond, if you please. And reel off a few ice puns. Let's kick some ice. Wait, no, sorry, that's the wrong clip. Oh! He's cold cuts. Okay, yeah, that's the right one. I don't know how I could ever get those confused in my head. It probably would have been hard to find someone back then who would say Mr. Freeze was their favorite Batman villain, and he certainly wasn't a character that you took very seriously. But that all changed in the early 90s. Mr. Freeze only appeared three times in the original run of Batman the Animated Series, but that was all it really took for him to make a lasting impression and they actually serve as a pretty satisfying trilogy on their own, so let's go over them one by one. In the new canon established by the show, Mr. Freeze started out as Dr. Victor Freeze, a brilliant scientist married to a loving wife named Nora. When Nora was diagnosed with an incurable and fatal disease, Victor placed her in a specially made cryogenic chamber to freeze her in suspended animation until a cure could be developed. In the middle of this process, Freeze is interrupted by his boss, Ferris Boyle, who is upset with Victor for using company funds and property for his own personal experiments. A struggle ensues, and Victor gets knocked into a table full of chemicals that cause a train reaction, changing his biological makeup at the atomic level so that he is no longer able to survive in anything other than a sub-zero environment. Now irrevocably numb to all emotion and believing Nora to have been killed in the accident, Victor sets his sight on revenge. Victor's attempt to seek what is in his mind justice is what takes up most of the plot of Heart of Ice. This of course leads to an inevitable confrontation with Batman, as the caped crusader doesn't take too kindly to how many innocent civilians are put in danger by Freeze's attempted vengeance. Although he does show compassion for Freeze on multiple occasions once he learns of the villain's origins. I saw what happened to your wife. I'm sorry. For the most part, it plays out like a standard episode of the animated series. Batman and Freeze have a second act confrontation, Batman gets captured, Freeze leaves him to put his overly complicated plan into action, 
Batman escapes, subdues Freeze, and exposes Boyle as Nora's murderer. Both Boyle and Freeze get locked up, Batman watches over a mournful victor now confined to a cell in Arkham Asylum, and recedes into the shadows. Roll credits. Vengeance is a common motivator for Batman's enemies, but unlike other characters such as the Riddler, Poison Ivy, or the Scarecrow, Freeze's motivating factor is far more sympathetic. The Riddler captures and tries to kill his old boss because he unfairly fired him. Poison Ivy seduces and poisons Harvey Dent because he built a prison on land that was home to a rare and endangered species of flower. And Scarecrow wants revenge on the professor that expelled him from the university he worked at because he was being a literal sociopath and torturing people to conduct psychological experiments. Freeze, on the other hand, has his wife killed in front of him and has his body forever changed so that he can no longer feel the touch of another person. All of these characters, Freeze included, are fighting back against figures of authority, people that have wronged them and hold power over them. But the difference is that everyone except for Freeze is seeking retribution that far exceeds the initial injustices that were committed upon them. Freeze's inciting incident is the only one that, from a certain perspective, feels understandable. We may not be able to relate to having our loved one murdered in front of us, something that both our hero and villain share in common, by the way. But much like Batman, we can pity Mr. Freeze. We don't sympathize with characters like Riddler, Ivy, or Scarecrow because their actions aren't reasonable. But for Freeze, the opposite is true. We're able to show him sympathy despite the fact that he isn't being reasonable. And that's part of what makes him a memorable villain. And let's not get it confused, Mr. Freeze is a villain. Although we may sympathize with him, it's important to remember that he is acting mostly out of anger. He's self-centered, unable to feel empathy for anyone other than himself, and will stop at nothing to have his revenge that he feels he justly deserves. Leave him. He should have been more careful. Now he's paid the price for his incompetence. But he's one of us! Then perhaps you'd like to share his fate. Freeze is not someone to be looked up to. He claims to want justice, but what he actually wants is to see Boyle suffer, and more importantly, he wants to see him suffer at his own hands. It's because of this that, despite the fact that Heart of Ice is commonly hailed as the best the series has to offer, I actually think it's the weakest of the three we're going to go over. While you do have the debut of Freeze's new backstory, which was so well received that it became his new official origin in the comics as well, this is still the most one note Victor is going to be over the course of the series. And it doesn't always stick to the dark and gritty tone you might have remembered. If you're going to go sneaking around a crowded office building, you'll need this. Knockout gas? Chicken soup. What was that stuff? The only way to fight a cold. But it does set up some important precedents that later episodes would build on, one of those being that Mr. Freeze is rarely the worst person in his episodes. In Heart of Ice, we had Ferris Boyle playing the more cartoonish villain, and in Freeze's second appearance, Deep Freeze, we have Grant Walker, an aging theme park inventor who is essentially what you would get if you crossed Andrew Ryan from Bioshock with Walt Disney. At the beginning of the episode, Victor is broken out of Arkham Asylum by a robot under the control of Walker. Once free, Walker reveals that one of the beneficial side effects to Victor's accident is that it has slowed his aging down to the point where he is now essentially immortal, and Walker wants Freeze to do the same for him. Victor is, unsurprisingly, glib about this whole idea. I want to live like this. Abandoned and alone. A prisoner in a world you can see but never touch. Old and infirm as you are, I'd trade a thousand of my frozen years for your worst day. But he eventually decides to go along with Walker's plan once he's able to provide Victor with something he wants in return. The still comatose body of Nora. While all of this is going on, Batman and Robin have deduced that Freeze is being kept in Walker's newest park, Oceana where Walker plans to start a new society filled only with the people he deems worthy, and cleanse the rest of the world by plunging it into a second ice age. Obviously, the dynamic duo take issue with this plan, so they jump into action to stop it. But they are eventually restrained by more of Walker's mechanized lackeys, and this is where they once again come face to face with one Mr. Victor Freeze. After completing the transformation of Walker into chilly immortality, Victor is offered a chance to join Walker as he leaves to put his dastardly plan into motion. 
but Freeze declines, wanting only to be left alone with Nora. But it doesn't take long for Batman to convince Freeze to let them go, by leveraging the fact that even if he's able to cure Nora and revive her, she probably wouldn't be too happy that her husband aided a madman in turning the entire Earth into a popsicle. So Victor Freeze are two heroes, and they team up to stop Walker. Our new dream team makes short work of Walker's robots, and Walker himself gets frozen to the side of his giant ice gun. But things start to take a turn for the worse when Freeze sets the weapon to backfire, causing Oceana to quickly turn into a city-sized iceberg. Now in a race against the clock, Batman and Robin flee the sinking city with all the other bystanders. They try to bring Freeze along with them, but he refuses, wanting instead to stay with Nora. When they try to force him to go, Victor freezes Robin, forcing Batman to focus on saving his sidekick and giving Freeze enough time to elude them. Our heroes escape, Walker is last seen trapped in a block of ice for all eternity, and the episode ends with Victor and Nora safe in an enclosed block of ice. Although its definition can mean slightly different things to different people, empathy is often described as a sort of deeper level of sympathy. When you sympathize with someone, you're able to feel sorrow for them, but without necessarily relating to them. On the other hand, once you're able to visualize yourself in that person's shoes, then that feeling becomes empathy. And this is why I tried to firmly draw that line earlier about Mr. Freeze's depiction in Heart of Ice being sympathetic, but not necessarily empathetic. Because I don't feel like that changeover starts to happen until Nora is reintroduced into his life. With Nora a part of the equation again, this lets Victor's actions be motivated by something other than just revenge. He is, of course, still operating based on a self-centered desire to get Nora back, even if it means doing something that she may not approve of. But the line does start to blur when that same contradiction is what ultimately leads him to making his turn, albeit for only a short amount of time. But for a brief moment, he does get to be one of the heroes, and we get to feel good about rooting for him. Nora gives Victor hope again, and while we may not always agree with his methods, she allows us to get a little closer to his perspective. She prompts us to ask the question, what would I be willing to do to save someone I loved? And the question of what links you would go to to save the person you loved most is a question that has been used just as often to make us relate to a hero as it has a villain. Before we move on, I do want to make a quick aside here to get this out of the way. Otherwise, it's just going to be uncomfortably hanging over everything I still have to say. Using Nora as a device to humanize Victor is a trope that has a lot of baggage attached to it. Nora is a character who is never given any real agency of her own. No actor was ever cast to play her because she literally has no voice. They are both ultimately just lines on paper, or words in a script, but through the power of animation, Victor gets to feel like a real person, but Nora is just shapes and colors in the form of a person. For the purpose of this show, Nora and this ceramic figurine are the same thing. They have the same purpose. They're nothing more than plot devices, simply objects. The subtitle of this video is Lessons Animation Taught Us, and while I think this show definitely taught me a lot of valuable things, it's probably worth pointing out that it might have also taught me a few things that weren't so good as well. The final part of what I consider Mr. Freeze's three-act story concludes, not in another episode of the animated series, but instead in the hour-long direct-to-video movie, Batman and Mr. Freeze, Sub-Zero. I think watching this movie is what finally made me turn the corner on Mr. Freeze and made him my favorite villain. Much like how The Dark Knight feels more like a movie about the Joker, Sub-Zero really feels like Victor's story that just so happens to have Batman in it. In fact, we don't even get to see the Caped Crusader until nearly ten minutes into the movie. The film instead opens with Victor, who appears to be almost fully reformed from his days of crime. He's now living in an arctic cave with Nora still in suspended animation, and he seems pretty content to just wait until an eventual cure is created. He has his two pet polar bears to keep him company, and he even looks after a young orphaned Inuit boy named Kunak. All things considered, Victor is starting to seem like a pretty decent guy. But this is a superhero movie, and we need some conflict, so that doesn't last very long. A submarine tries to surface from under the cavern Freeze and his makeshift family are living in, which causes Nora's capsule to be broken. To say Victor doesn't take this little incident too well would be a bit of an understatement. What in the name of... My god, what happened? It's the whole crew! Not quite. Ah! 
Now, with Nora's containment vessel broken, time is of the essence, and Victor needs to find a cure for her within two weeks' time before her disease ends up killing her. So he decides to enlist... Okay, abducts an old colleague, Dr. Gregory Belson. Belson tells Freeze that the only way to save Nora is to get her an organ transplant, which would prove fatal for the donor. Unconcerned with the consequences, Freeze sets off to kidnap the best possible candidate, Barbara Gordon, otherwise known as Batgirl. While she's on a date with Dick Grayson, the alter ego of Robin, Freeze breaks into the restaurant, capturing Barbara and incapacitating Robin. After failing to stop Freeze, Batman and Robin track Barbara down to an abandoned oil rig, and a rescue mission ensues. Not one to wait around and be saved, Barbara makes her own attempt to escape, but while doing so, Belson ends up shooting one of the fuel containers, causing a raging fire. After some brief fighting, Freeze realizes if he really wants to save Nora, then they have to get everyone off this oil rig before it goes down in flames. So he once again teams up with our heroes. Batman and Barbara are able to save Kunak and Nora and take them to the Batwing so they can make their eventual escape. When Batman goes back for Freeze, Victor ends up falling into a fiery abyss and is presumed dead. As the movie draws to a close, we learn that Nora was able to get the organ transplant she needed to survive, with funding being provided by the Wayne Foundation. And the last thing we see is Victor learning of this news as he sheds a single tear. Flanked by his two polar bears, he limps into the sunset, content knowing that Nora is healthy and safe. Redemption is something that I think most of us want to believe in on a deep, primal level, even if we're not always conscious of it. Like I said up top, when we're young, we're taught to idolize and imitate our heroes, but we all kind of know deep down that that isn't always attainable. Nobody, even the nicest person you know, is good 100% of the time. We all mess up, especially kids. You do things that get you in trouble, and you're not even sure why you did them in the first place. You'll get jealous and steal your siblings' toys, you'll get angry and yell at your parents, or you'll tell a little white lie, sometimes for no other reason than just because you can. And this is where introducing more nuance into your typically broader stories can have some unintended consequences. In a more generic story, one focused on a flatter depiction of good versus evil, it's easy to pick a side. We have our heroes, aspirational paragons of truth and justice, and we have our villains, one-note evildoers that stand in direct opposition from our hero. They exist on either end of a spectrum, with us the audience in the middle, a normal person who inherently wants to be good but is still capable of making mistakes. The problem with a character like Mr. Freeze is that he doesn't clearly fit into this binary. He's too morally gray. And this is what often happens when you have a good villain, and why we like them so much. Because they now exist somewhere in the middle, just like us. They are now the most relatable character in the story, and I think this is part of why we like redemption stories so much. They help us cope with our fallibility. They make us believe that even if we do something we know is wrong, there's still hope for us. We can still be the good guy. With the power of hindsight and almost 20 years of age and experience, it's easy for me to sit here now and question how truly redeemable Mr. Freeze is as a character. And I know by now you're probably getting tired of hearing me say this, but when you're a kid, that's not so easy to discern. This archetype, the redemptive villain, is something I always gravitated towards growing up, far more often than the more milquetoast heroes they were usually cast against. And all the observations I've made up until this point have been an attempt to deconstruct where all that allure came from in the first place. But we're over 15 minutes into this video now, and observations are mostly all I've given you. We haven't really talked much about what these observations taught us, what they taught me. And there's a reason for that, because I've kind of grown increasingly concerned that the things I learned may not have been as helpful as I would have liked. I'd like to say that characters like Mr. Freeze taught me to believe that there is inherent good inside everyone, and more importantly, that that inherent goodness is something that can be appealed to, and ultimately lead to that person's salvation. I'd like to believe that if we could just stop and talk to each other and reconcile our differences, we could all work together to make the world a better place. But as I sit here now, saying all of this in 2018, surrounded by the chaotic mess our world has become, I can't help but think this perspective feels like the naive dream of a child that has no real application when it comes to thwarting real-world villains. I may not have knowingly internalized it at the time, but I think Mr. Freeze was the first time I was confronted with the idea of 
the ends justify the means. Because that's a motto that utterly defines his character, and the world is filled with Mr. Freezes. Most of us don't go through life thinking we're the bad guy. We all have our own moral compasses, and we all do what we think is right. The difference between right and wrong is subjective, and the people who do bad things firmly believe what they are doing is for the greater good, even though in reality, it's just for the benefit of themselves. For them, the ends do justify the means. They can't be reasoned with, and they can't be saved because they don't want to be saved. And this is why, out of all the sympathetic villains I've loved over the years, I picked Mr. Freeze to talk about specifically. Because he embodies this struggle so well. Ask yourself, by the end of Sub-Zero, how much has Victor actually changed? Is there any evidence that suggests that the next time he's faced with a decision between doing what is best for him and what is best for someone else, that he'll choose the latter? I don't think so, but there lies the problem because when I was younger, I couldn't really comprehend that. The archetype of the redemptive villain certainly fits many of the characters I was fond of in my adolescence. But what I can better understand now is that Mr. Freeze doesn't fit as cleanly into that mold as I would have thought. Because most of those other characters do complete that redemption arc. They might have slip-ups and setbacks, and sometimes their retribution ends up costing them their life, but by the time the story ends, more often than not, they've been fully reformed. And it's a satisfying end to a story that, to this day, still hasn't gotten old. But it isn't realistic, it's escapism. It's a fairy tale. In that sense, Mr. Freeze is actually a shockingly accurate portrayal of a real-world villain. Maybe Batman the Animated Series did have something useful to teach me. I just wasn't old enough to properly learn what it had to say. Okay, so admittedly, this would be a bit of a bummer to go out on, so if you'll allow it, there is just one more thing I want to touch on before I send all of you back to your own respective corners of the internet. The conundrum of what to do with people who do bad things is one born out of an adult's perspective, once you've hopefully for yourself already established your own morals. But, and say it with me one more time folks, when you're a kid, the difference between right and wrong is something that is usually told to you, not something you define for yourself. So, in my case, as a young boy who grew up in a very conservative, very religious, and quite frankly very white part of Oklahoma, an already exceptionally conservative part of America, well, let's just say my definition of good and bad has changed quite a bit over the years. A lot of what I was implicitly taught by the community I grew up in was bad was actually just different. People that looked different than me, or had different religions or cultures than me, weren't bad, they just had a life experience that was completely foreign to me. And even for adults, that foreignness often scares them. But the funny thing is, once you get out of that culture you were raised in, and once you're actually exposed to and start to talk to, and more importantly listen to those people, and let them tell you their stories, you can start to learn that maybe what you were told was bad wasn't actually true. And that's the starting point for being able to come up with your own moral compass, your own definition of right and wrong. and. I dare say that starts to make you a better person. And look, this isn't a perfect comparison. As I've already made it clear, Mr. Freeze chose to do the things he did. He wasn't made a villain because he was different, he was made a villain because of his actions. But much like how it's hard to tell the difference between a character who has actually been redeemed and one who hasn't, these nuances are often lost on us at a young age. And ultimately, this is what gives me hope. Because while it may not have been a perfect analog, I think shows like the animated series helped me question my preconceived notions of what right and wrong meant. And yeah, maybe it isn't the best blueprint for how to deal with actual bad people, but I want to hold on to the hope that, although it may be unlikely, some people's minds can be changed, just like mine was. This perspective may not always be rational, but I think it's better than the alternative. Because if you hold on to the idea that, at a certain point, no one is redeemable, well, that's a pretty depressing path to walk, and for myself at least, I feel like the only thing that lies at the end of that road is me giving up. The hope that, even if it's only the smallest percentage of those that disagree with us, can change? Is what keeps me going, and that hope was ingrained in me by shows like Batman. I'll always be thankful to have Batman the Animated Series to go back to and remind me of this. And I'll always be happy to have characters, perhaps despite my better judgment, like Mr. Freeze. I'll always find it more than a little poetic that, the only thing a series that was made so famous for being drawn on black paper had to do to create one of the most memorable characters ever was to simply add a little touch of grey.